The Ballad of Sleepy John Sleepy John, all his deliveries settled, his monies collected, nods out in the privacy of a concrete cubby under the Highway 59 overpass. Tires rumble overhead, the sound dampened by layers of concrete and rebar. Their noise is soothing to his fried mind. The city plays out on either side of the bridge. Two gas stations, five or six fast food joints, a strip mall on one side, and a grocery store on the other. Pedestrians with pockets full of money hurry to and fro as panhandlers and solicitors of every sort lurk around the forest station strips on either side of the intersection in search of a mark. Guys with cardboard signs, guys with squeegees, guys with money that was now in Sleepy John's pocket, and all of them cool with that. Pleased, Sleepy John smiles at his small fiefdom, not that it's truly his. It belongs to Big Ant, and damn it, he needs to see Ant after this and deliver the day's take. Sleepy John raises his head to come out of the nod. His eyes focus. Below, a car parks next to the curb. Not just any car by the look. Sleepy John knows a little bit about cars. It's hard to live in Houston and not know your motors. This is a beige or a sonat. From his vantage, John can see the emblem gleaming on the car's ass. He thinks, Holy shit, one of my boys about to score! As if to make him a prophet, a solicitor John knows as blue sees the sonat and waves to it. The driver gets out and waves back. Sleepy John shakes the confused, weak-fingered feeling of coming out of the nod from his own hands. He rubs his eyes, his brain booting back up, and the driver turns toward him, taking the first steps up the sloping concrete viaduct. The driver is wearing beige Armani, got to be. The suit looks like it might jump from his body and take golden flight. The driver's hair is blonde heading white. His smile is almost mirthful, but not quite. His eyes look sliced into his forehead. The slope does not at all affect the driver's gait. Sleepy John thinks, I guess I'm the one who's about to score, because, above and beyond all things, this guy is rich. He's rich, and he's got a lot of balls walking up the Little York Viaduct when no one knows him. Of course, with a car and a suit like that, everyone's probably thinking he's a mob boss. How do you like this bridge? The driver asks. Fuck, he's already up the viaduct. Goddamn dope. Sleepy John blinks. Last he knew, the guy was at the bottom of the hill. Fucking not out shit. He rubs his eyes again and turns on the hapless, hopeless charm. Sorry, buddy. Uh, reckon I fell asleep up here. How can I, uh, oh, uh, what's that you said? How do you like living under this bridge? The driver asks again. Uh, pardon me. He extends a long, delicate hand. Michel Van Outen. Enchanté. A weird feeling of glee bursts in Sleepy John's belly when he takes the man's soft hand into his own rough one to shake. He blinks rapidly, shuddering, trying to be still so the man won't notice, but it was as if an expert phlebotomist had fired an ice hit into his jugular when their palms interact. A no-cough rush, just the instant ebullience of a perfect hit and maybe a pearl of ejaculate soaking into his boxers. Sleepy John says, Pleased to make your acquaintance. His voice is cracking, and he swallows. Uh, I guess I don't like it very much, being up under here. Pretty damn dirty. It's not really safe, either. Michel feigns shock, mouth open, eyes slit, almost flirty. This is a ten million dollar home, sir. You should feel blessed by God. Sleepy John chuffs. <laughs> right, because the bridge cost about that much. <laughs> you got me there, sir. The men laugh together for a minute, and Michel says, You strike me as a man who takes initiative. I saw you running around from man to man out there. Michel winks. That's okay by me. Sleepy John thinks of Big Ant. This guy's gonna pull my skinny ragged ass away from you, pal. It makes sense now. This slick, smooth-tasting guy's a dealer. A big-time motherfucker. He's no... I need someone to move into one of the houses I intend to flip and fix it for me. You could hire anyone you want to for to do that. Sleepy John holds up a finger. Now... I do know how to fix up a trailer. I've done that before. Reckon a house ain't too different. I'll give it a shot. It isn't any different, Michel says, and I could hire another, but I don't want to. I have an affinity for the downtrodden, the vagabond. It's in my heart to, uh, aid a man like you in the process of self-betterment, should I happen to see promise in him after some observation. Michel leans forward. You and I are not that far removed. Would you believe it? Mister, that suit you got on tells me I'll believe whatever the hell you need me to for a settled-upon price, not to put too fine a point on it. 
Michel laughs again, but this time it is Basie. His smooth tenor returns when he speaks. Fair enough, Sleepy John, fair enough. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out a set of keys on a ring, then holds them out. He smiles at Sleepy John and nods to the key ring. Sleepy John takes the keys. Where am I going? Folger, ride down East Tex, right here on the access road. I know where that's at. Turn right down Folger and ride to the first stop sign you come to. You'll see a small white house that needs a lot of work squatting in a patchy yard to the left of the sign. It looks a bit like a scabby, pale troll. It is, for the time you work for me, yours. 418 Folger, to be exact. Michel winks. Not every day someone gives you a house, is it? No, it sure fucking is not. A few paranoid thoughts run through Sleepy John's head, most of them rapey. Not that he's that, oh no. But who the fuck is Michel, and why does he want to give some random... Nah, he'd already thought of all that garbage, so he swallows again and says, Okay, Michel, I got you, man. I'll be there. He takes the keys and puts them in his pocket. You gotta... But Michel is already halfway down the viaduct, whistling to himself. Blue stands at the curb, ready. Not too close to the Sonat, but close enough. Michel snaps his fingers, and Old Blue runs up to him. Multiple green bills pass hands, and Old Blue howls, These are hundreds, man! Michel puts his finger to his lips and gets back into the car. Blue pockets the money and scuttles back to his bedroll by the pylons, where he ducks under his blanket for a moment before coming up again with his smartphone. Now Sleepy John is awake. He unlocks his bike from the running utility poles. He straddles the ten-speed and pumps the pedals. He blows by Blue with a thumbs up and skids right onto East Tex. Hauling ass strictly from curiosity, he's almost a Folger when he realizes he'd never seen Michel reach into his coat, or his pocket, to get the money for Blue. The cash had just been in his hand. No way. Impossible. He blamed the dope again. Must have blinked. Don't do that or you'll miss your whole life. Besides, he had a house as of right now, so who cares? Three weeks later, Sleepy John wakes up on a dusty, trash-picked couch inside 418 Folger. His muscles groan. God damn it, you always wake up sick. And he tries to sit up. Sun leaks through a blanket that covers the window, a blanket Sleepy John has nailed up himself. He hasn't done a lot of work in these past weeks, and he knows it. Just the easy stuff. Busting out the walls with a sledgehammer had been nothing. Clearing all the tearaway and taking it to the Conoco dumpster with a buggy he'd connected to the back of the bike, illegal, but who gives a flying fuck, had been nothing. Fixing all the pipes and toilet and putting in new walls was a little something, which was why he hadn't done jack to it yet. But then again, Michel had not been by... Maybe he forgot. Yeah, right. Sleepy John rubs his eyes, digging the seeds out of his sockets. The crust rolls down the side of his nose, and he flicks it off his cheek. He groans, using the pillow to push himself up. Sweat breaks out on his forehead. His thighs burn with cuts that go deep but aren't really there. As soon as his feet hit the floor, nausea punches him in the stomach, and he grabs his abdomen, forearms protecting the girdle, waiting for his grinding guts to make their lumber move. He hasn't fixed the bathroom yet and has only a bucket to shit in. Still, he smiles on his way to it. It's fantastic, see, that he needs a go so quickly. Not all mornings are as kind, and without the go, there is no buzz. As soon as Sleepy John sits on the bucket, the excrement crawls back up his colon. He runs his hand through his short hair, pushing, sweating, wishing he had a real bowl. Once he gets a little relief, he grabs his knees and breathes, staring at the floor. Michel's an artist. I think he does dope. I bet he never gets sick. He's rich. He can afford it. Was that a weird thought to have at a moment like this? He isn't sure. Doesn't think too deeply on it. Sleepy John reaches out for the cheap nightstand he's using for a hygiene cabinet. Thing might as well be made of balsa wood, so he's careful when he snatches the roll of toilet paper from the top of it. The whole thing still wobbles, as if glued rather than screwed together. Fuck's sake. He cleans himself up with the cottony cob. Gotta do this work, man. And he did. And he would. Toilet. Sink. Get on YouTube and look up the how-to. Sleepy John carries the shit bucket into the backyard, where he dumps it into the trees next to his neighbor's fence. He frowns at the area around the scabrous roots. His old patties, flattened by rain and dried into cakes by the sun, still linger on the grass, feeding the trees. The neighbors, if they bother to notice, probably think he has a dog. He sighs, thinking, That's about where I'm at in life. A dog. Shit in the yard and eat my own sicker. 
In the bedroom, he grabs his kit, a rattling cigar box full of works, and sits down, legs crisscrossing on the floor. A painted bikini babe on a beach he'd never visit blows him a kiss from the cardboard box lid when he bends it backward, and he reaches for his utensils, the crushed can bottom, forceps, torch lighter, a clean syringe, and the baggie in the corner. The wad of black tar within is almost gone. Lucky for Sleepy John, it was cold outside. Summer and forgetting to put the tar in the fridge equals a major pain in the ass. He hated having to teabag a melted sack in can water. You lose much dope that way. He carefully unwraps the moist nugget and, after a moment's consideration, decides it isn't enough to cut in half. About two sixteenths was left. Might as well get a decent morning whack. Sometimes a man has to be liberal. He fixes up leans back against the mattress and sighs. His belly quiets by slow degrees. The nausea goes away. A last wave of sweat pops out behind his ears, and he titters, staring at the ceiling. Sleepy John forces himself to stay awake until the whole high takes hold of his musculature. He reaches over his head and stretches, then stands up. Time to call Big Ant. Sleepy John holds the phone to his ear. He listens to Juice World, waiting for the man to pick up. Click. Sup, Sleepy? Big Ant already knows who it is, of course. Sleepy John crosses his fingers and asks, Got work? Yeah, Big Ant says. I'm home, come on. Ten minutes. Sleepy John reaches for the ceiling again and arches his back damn near in half. He bends forward and touches his toes. It was easy. His body was quite limber. At 6'2 and 70 kilos, it ought to be. He needed to pack on some extra weight. That meant working. Now he had extra incentive to crush all this house flip DIY business for Michelle. Man, that slick ass dude got to do dope, Sleepy John thinks, some part of his mind still trying to escape all the effort ahead. If he can maybe get Michelle on the roster, well, maybe he'd just hire someone else to do the work while Sleepy John just hung around. Meh, dope dreams. No way could he turn Michelle into a swing. He lights a smoke. He throws his jacket on and takes one last look at the bucket. Fuck that. I'll do my diligence. I ain't going to no bitch-ass home with the pot, though. Fuck I look like with a toilet in my buggy. Let me make the rounds first and make a buck or two, and maybe I'll look on Amazon to see what a cheap commode costs. Cheap-ass porcelain gall can't be more than 50 bucks, tops. He slings his backpack over his shoulders. Bottled water and an extra shirt if he needs it. An extra knife. A digital clock. Street name for battery-powered scales. And a loaded 25, just in case. He's never pulled it. Everyone knows he works for Big Ant, and that's usually enough to keep them chill during transactions, even when the nuttier fiends get wicked ideas. He pulls up to Big Ant's iron gate, the morning shot wearing off a bit from the bike ride. He hits the buzzer next to the gate with a shaking finger. When the gate pops, Sleepy John sidles around one wrought iron wing, smiling at the dead flowers and stone pots that line the cobbled driveway. Before Sleepy John reaches the front door, a big mahogany monstrosity with a star on it, Big Ant throws it open, smiling. You good? He asks. I will be. Sleepy John, head down, coughs into his sleeve before he goes in. The first thing he sees is Big Ant's drum kit, a pearl. It is built of an insane number of drums and cymbals. The goddamn thing looks to Sleepy John, who is not at all musically inclined, like the console of a spaceship. He flicks a cymbal on his way to the couch. How the fuck you play these things? Big Ant grins. Oh, I got my ways, bruh. I keep telling you let me play for you. Jesus, no. My ears can't handle all that racket. Old man. And compared to Big Ant, all the fucking 24 and already easily part of the middle class house owner set, he was old at 32. He felt 60 right now. Yeah, I am. That dope you give me didn't cut the mostaza. Big Ant, instead of answering, sits down behind the drums. Before Sleepy John protests, he begins playing something that sounds to Sleepy John like eight million elephants running after the same piece of pussy. He plugs his ears and tries screaming, but Big Ant merely grins and plays faster. Staccato on the ride, flams and rolls and blasts on snare and tom. Stop it, goddammit! Big Ant sets the sticks down gently on the snare, doubling over from his own raucous laughter. (laughs) <laughs> All right, I got you. You wasn't getting out of the day without hearing me pound some skin, son. Yeah, I could have skipped it. I'm sure you're the best damn drummer ever to walk the bitch ass earth, but I told you I can't take all that loud ass ramming shit, especially not at eight the fuck in the morning. Giggling, Big Ant walks into the kitchen. You funny, John. He opens the freezer, reaches inside, and Sleepy John turns, catching the brown paper bag sailing through the air. He looks at it and then back to Big Ant, who is now holding a nickel bag of dope between his fingers. Still what a bagged up, but this? 
jump for you, bro. Wants it, Fetty? Fuck Fetty. It's better. <laughs> hey, now, I don't want to die, Aunt. Sleepy John squints at the bag of special when Big Aunt hands it to him. I don't know, dude. That Fetty sick's bad enough. I can't be. This won't make you sick. It's gonna fix the hole, you, Jay. When I lied to you, huh? Has it ever been even once? No. Sleepy John isn't truly sure of this, but it seems right. Sleepy John rides up his gravel driveway. He still needs to see Big Ant and deliver the 800 loons he'd collected during his ride through the back streets of East Aldine. But first, oh, first, a shot. Big Ant could wait. He understands. This bag of special was as white as the driven snow. The fool might mistake it for cocaine. Sweat again, his collar soaking wet. The door in his vision, sound of the bike clattering uncared for on the gravel. Tink to tink, and lots of stony crunching noises. Skitch of a tire, all these sounds still ringing in his head as he breathlessly fixes a shot. Who gives a fuck about money when you got dope? He almost spills an entire sixteenth of powder in his rush for the rush and instead hits the can deftly in the middle and with a squirt of water from the bottle next to him makes the mix and cooks up and taps the vein with expert aplomb. Sleepy John tilts his head back and blows all the air out of his belly, getting his bearings. Falling backward, missing the bed this time, when his skull bashes against the hardwood floor, Sleepy John doesn't notice anything more than a light pressure behind his eyes. He sees the bucket, got to get that commode, and then, through an eye tunnel he flies, bordered by bulbs of orange flesh. Cones and triangles scatter themselves in his vision. Gleaming eyes, the alien trailer hitch eyes of the cow, and the black blood diamonds of flying high again on that madman. Pink metal cuts into his skin, three lazy bongs of a slow bell. He is stripped, degloved, left a wall of muscle, organ, and bone. All is painless but terribly hot. Distorted crunch of the letter E in his brain, minor, slash and tug of electric cords, dirty, stretching string sounds like an award-winning pig being slaughtered inside a giant digital squawk box. There is a sensation like a swift kick in the ass, flying through a white curtain, and he sees a scene of abject horror, accompanying notes, dark and jaunty like shadows flirting with each other, bounce across his eyes. Terrified people flee from the assault of a roiling sky which vomits liquid fire over the chaos below in caustic, constant blobs. Black, orange, red, and blue flames belch together, flutter and flow. And the terrified cook as they scamper. Flesh bubbles, buckets of blood burst boiling from spit, charred hunks of fleeing meat. Screams become dog whistles as the true abandon of pure helplessness overtakes the burning populace. This is the entire world. An odd thought. Am I the great son of the same name, Prophet? And there is laughter. Crowds of broiling people caught in their own despairing mosh can join into a tower of carbonized material. It rises, spreading, a shadow made of blackened burn scars. Two streams of fire prick the spots where eyes should be. Wings, black to the point of purpling, unfurl behind the monstrous deity. A stanchion of gold appears on either side of its swelling chest. These become arms. The gold shifts to human bone. A gnarled phalange, spear sharp, juts and lowers, stretching into Sleepy John's skinless face. Astaroth is your name, Prophet John. You are elect. Elect? His brain isn't strong enough to process such criteria. He is a junkie redneck, a street urchin, a chop fucking copper dude, and a demon, for that must be what it is, guffaws when the thought forms in John's human mind. Yes, you are. The sharp phalange pricks into sleepy John's heart. He hears a nonsense phrase. Ice. It is ice, the blackness coursing through his veins. This is not a drug. He feels it is not a test. This dream is a report. This dream is real. This dream is presque vu. This dream is actually happening. He returns to wakefulness from the caress of a smooth tenor. Well, I see you haven't done very much, John. Huh? Sleepy John scrambles from the floor to his feet. He's been asleep, so the drugs in his system are all sitting uselessly in his kidneys and liver. His stomach lurches and he covers his mouth. Oh, sorry, boss. Huh? Well, shit. He doubles over the bucket and opens his mouth. A wad of snot the size of a dinner plate falls loudly into the bottom of the bucket. To his surprise, when Sleepy John looks back at Michel, the dapper man isn't angry. He's holding a loaded rig. John, you could have just said something. 
Michelle stabs Sleepy John's bare shoulder with the hit and pushes the plunger. Sleepy John jumps away from the bucket, rubbing his arm. What the fuck? Michelle lays his hands on Sleepy John's head. Do you know you are the Mercury, the messenger that comes with fire? Or do you know? Sleepy John has no time to answer. Whatever Michelle gave him feels like a cross between the best shot he's ever had and an instant dope sick. There's something cocaine-like to it. Michelle is speaking the weird language from Sleepy John's dream. He bats at Michelle's hands and pushes his back flush against the wall, trying to stand, trying to get away. Fuck this house. Fuck Michelle. He'd go stay in Big Ant's shed for a minute after he got out of this and get his bearings. Deliver the money, a hundred bucks, and Michelle lets go of his head. You should probably get up and pay the man, he says. Eight hundred dollars is no pittance. It's even worse if you're a businessman. That shot should be working by now. What do you think? I feel like God, Sleepy John says. Oh, but I ain't. I got to get this cash to Big Ant. Who are you, man? Someone you know, Michel says. Go run your errand. And he is gone. The blanket over the aperture flutters. Sleepy John hears footsteps and the front door closing. And there is nothing else for a moment. An owl hoots outside. He didn't hear those very often, if at all, in Texas. He couldn't think of a time he had. It hoots again, and Sleepy John wheels his mountain bike out the back door. Before he bounces the tires down the concrete steps, he digs into his pocket to make sure the money is all still there. At Big Ant's gate, he feels like much less than God. Certainly, God would have money. He hits the buzzer. The gate clicks, and Sleepy John wheels his bike up the driveway. He has time to think of Michelle and the things the man said. Big Ant answers the door, smiling. I knew my boy would come through. You got the bread? Sleepy John hands over the money. Big Ant counts it. Smiling, he puts it in his pocket, and at the same time, his smile disappears. The gun fills Sleepy John's vision. Why the fuck ain't you dead, ho? Big Ant asks. I fed your ass to Astaroth, grease motherfucker. He cocks the pistol. Sleepy John throws up his hands. What the fuck, man? Fuck you mean, Astaroth? Who? Big Ant takes a step and presses the gun into Sleepy John's forehead. He cringes against his bike frame, gripping the handlebars to keep himself leveraged. He does not move. He can hear his breath whistling through his exposed teeth. <laughs> One eye squished closed, the bridge of his nose trying to wrinkle into his eye socket, and his other eye is barely open, staring at the concrete next to Big Ant's feet. Astaroth, motherfucker! The goddamn devil! Satan, bitch! That's Astaroth! <laughs> Fools don't know that shit. I know that shit. And I sold your ass to him. I'm gonna get the fuck out of this dope game. I'm a drummer, goddammit. You heard me play. He was the shit, huh? I fucking don't like drums, Ant. The pistol smashes against Sleepy John's face. Warmth and fluid and wires fill his mouth. He spits out a wad of hot blood with two teeth in it. They splatter and rattle into the driveway. I got a call from left-handed beast, fool. You know who that is? Nah, you wouldn't. They're metal. Like this shit. Like this shit I'm gonna stick in your mouth right now. Open up, bitch! Sleepy John doesn't open his mouth by himself. Big Ant helps him with the pistol. He tries to protest. <laughs> Big Ant sneers. <laughs> nah, I think I got to, man. Shit go like that. It's part of the deal, bet. He turns Sleepy John toward the open door. Walk backward, punk. Slow. We going to the bathroom. Sleepy John lashes out. Big Ant, twitching reflexively, pulls the trigger. Sleepy John sees the moment where the defensive reflex took over faster for Big Ant's finger than it did for Sleepy John's fist. Fucking way she goes, can't dodge a bullet, and felt the back of his head come apart. It didn't hurt. It felt like a big, pressurized slap. Wet. It burned. It felt like puking backward. Talking out the side of your neck, Sleepy! And he heard himself laugh. Big Ant, frozen, says... Oh my god. Sleepy John sees his foot twitch, his gun still pointed but shaking in his hand. I think, Sleepy John says, that you fell prey to the mark inside, bitch. What? Conflagration. The flaming blast of too much lighter fluid against already treated wood. Big Ant jumps away, turns in the air, and the door closes on its own just in time to break his nose for him. Sleepy John feels the strength of his demonic carbonization. He is no longer John, but another thing. Three words float through what's left of his psyche. The Chosen One. Hunger shreds his belly. 
The hunger of a week with no food. The hunger where you can't eat. Where you have to nibble until your gut's awake, ready to eat all the meat on the planet. And eat he would. Big Ant is on his knees. One of his hands fights with an immovable doorknob, and the other works to reset the bridge of his nose. Blood flows, and Demon John lets some of the red essence spill from Big Ant's flowing nostrils into his blackened claw. Big Ant stops wrestling with the doorknob and stares up at what used to be a pathetic junkie. Now a goddamn no-bullshit boy are you fuck demon, drinking his snotty blood as if it were Dom. You're supposed to be... But Big Ant says nothing else. The monstrous diner takes his human head, still blubbering, into its mouth. Demon John can feel Big Ant's awareness. Pain lingers as bone crunches. As the jaw masticates over human cheeks, Demon John knows Big Ant can feel his once glowing hustler's eyes loosening in their broken, bloody sockets. And, in the throes of a good meal, Demon John sucks one of these eyes down its rippling throat and, finding the texture gristly, spits the eye back into Big Ant's face or the soup which is left of it. Half is distended but otherwise normal. The other half is a bowl of gristle and little balls of white tendon mashed into black cherry pudding. Yellow bone chips spread over the rent meat like potato chips crumbled over tomato soup. The demon can see its own fang marks and a few diamond scratches in the bone. Enough for art, it supposed. Then, jaws widening, it takes Big Ant's whole head down its Tartarian throat, which has grown serrated teeth. Demon John did try to flap its his feeling almost human after food wings before he got on the bike. Muscles that didn't exist before cramp very fast. His brain is trying to assimilate and use new flesh, so he's awkward, and riding a bike is no simple feat. A thug riding by in a tricked-out Honda Accord cries out his open window, It's no Halloween, way! and honks the horn. Demon John laughs. He rides the rest of the way down the street and turns toward a gas station. The bike spills. His weight, he's gaining exponentially, has popped the tires and Demon John gets to his feet and tries his wings again. Still too much burn and cramp action when he rises four feet into the air. No chance of flying yet. Jesus fucking Palomino! A voice in the night. Demon John whirls and sees two black-clad men, also on bikes, staring at him from the other side of the dark street. One of them is pointing. That motherfucker flew, dog! Demon John strikes forward, not flying, cutting through the air with his clawed toes scraping the cement. He attacks, mouth open, half of the first man's head gone and swallowed. John clamps his whirling, roto-rooter teeth over the next man's head, and he thinks, It's because I used to eat the heads off the chocolate bunnies first. And he's gulping sweet meat from his victim's throat, his demonic gizzard spinning and crunching cartilage, larynx and esophagus. Demon John yanks his head backwards to get a breath. A guttural cheer flutters around the fat rope of intestines streaming between his lips. He harumps, and the teeth in his throat spin again. Chopping the log in half, John spits the trash flesh stuck between his teeth on the concrete. Freeze! Get down on the ground, motherfucker! Whoa! <laughs> Shit of goddamn! John's voice is now guttural fuzz. It's the bitch-ass police! He does not get down on the ground. Instead, he takes one confident step, and the cops open fire. The bullets tickle, and John giggles, still stepping toward the cops as if he's going to say hi to a buddy. One is screaming into his radio, and John decides, that'll do, and flies. The pistol, when John and its barrel meet, does not break. The shock of collision rips the officer's arm from his shoulder. Sound of exploding laundry. The cop's face is shocked and paling by degrees as he watches an instant jetty of his own stupid blood wash the left side of his body. John biffs him in the temple and his head flies off his neck, rebounds off the top of the cruiser, and John catches it. Demon John stares into the shocked face and says, Oh no! Please God help me! He laughs. Little late for that, isn't it? The other officer is barking into a police radio. John can hear terrified voices screaming instructions on the other side of the black box and the crescendo of sirens in the distance, the whoop 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 of helicopter blades in the sky not too far off. Catch, he says. The officer catches his partner's head and screams. John walks into the middle of the road as if nothing is going on. The sirens get louder. Slick luxury sports ride breaking in front of Demon John, he hops away before they collide. A gold desert eagle pops out of the open window and takes the officer's head off. Michel. Flesh lands on Demon John's mouth. He tries it. Salty. Get in, John! It's time to go to work! 
He opens the passenger door. Have you eaten? Yes, sir. When Demon John gets into the Sonat, it's like he shrinks to fit. It does not hurt. It feels like the most normal thing in the world. Good, good. Michel floors the gas pedal and the Sonat is just gone. Habit forces Demon John to check the side view mirrors for red and blues. Michel lays a hand over his thigh and pats carbonized flesh. You don't have to worry about those things anymore, John. Michel, Lucifer, John knows now, and Michel interrupts him with, Yes, that I am. The last shred of humanity in John weeps in the back of his newly demonic mind. Lucifer can feel it, and John can feel Lucifer. Both devils cry together for a moment. Shall I pull over? Lucifer asks. We're having a moment. I don't know, John, Astaroth says. I feel like there's two of me in my head and heart fighting for humiliation over my whole self. I That's very perceptive for a junkie, Lucifer says. You speak clearer as well. Do you find yourself smarter, more powerful, dare I say, unlocked? I do. But still he doubles over, crying for his lost humanity, a wasted life. Lucifer pulls to the soft shoulder. They're already in the middle of the desert. Good old Highway 50. Not a single cop in sight. And something tells Astaroth that his boss can hide them from view if he so chooses. Lucifer lays a warm hand over the back of Astaroth's carbon neck and gently rubs the knob Astaroth's spine makes in the skin. Astaroth leans into his boss, his friend, the one who created him, and cries, God! Oh God! God how! God please! Lucifer draws Astaroth close, petting his head, crying with him. I know. I know. He left me too. He doesn't listen to please, Astaroth. An old part of you knows that. Astaroth cries himself to sleep. When John wakes up, he's human again. He gets out of the car awkwardly, almost stumbling. Lucifer is there, smiling, in a black suit now, unbothered by the desert heat. John takes his hand. Lucifer helps him out of the Sonant. Do you want to go? You may if you wish. Stay like this. Enjoy what life you may. I just don't understand what's going on. Why me? I told you. Your stars were right. I sniff you out. There are seventy more of you to find. I have you. I'd like the whole Gietacon. Get the old band back together now. What do you say? I don't know what you want me to do. I want you to play Misty for me. Lucifer says and kisses John on the cheek. How many generations? A thousand? Ten? First they called you Toth, the Holy One from the stars. Then they made your message evil and anagrammed your name into Astarte after giving you a sex change. After a while, you grew goat legs and preached Jesus, and they said you were from Patmos. When your name was D, you found my pantheon and gave it to the world. Shall I continue? I'm a street junkie. Of course. What other karma do you think a chaos magician accrues over the years? Once we repurpose this planet, wait until you see what I do with Bill Ward. He's coming back too. I need another drummer since you ate the man I might have used. I... Lucifer gestures to the desert. Do you love them? Huh? Them. The people. You wanted to teach them. I told you it was foolish. Now look at you. Do you love them or what? We're late and I need you to decide. He snapped his fingers thrice. Fuck him! The demon in him, now emerging again, says. Lucifer circles him as he shifts back into demon form. Felicitations to us, Astaroth. You'll get used to your new legs and ability to shapeshift. Come! We have much to do! They walk hand in hand for a few steps, and then Lucifer lets go and John takes over. Strength fills him. His face changes. Lucifer rubs the back of his neck. Anger changes you. Save it for a useful moment. John calms. Where are we? Los Alamos, Lucifer says. The, um, back of beyond, I believe people call it. Middle of nowhere. Exactly where you should keep the things they have inside. Things we want. The glass door is open, and a man steps out. Haggard, he has the look of a man with an IQ hanging somewhere around the ionosphere. His eyes are crazed, wide. Sweat breaks out on his forehead. To his credit... His facial features are perfectly composed, a trick John never learned when he was sick, and his breathing, though visibly labored, chest slowly moving, a tiny O between the doctor's lips, and he says, Michel, Lord. 
He begins to shake. It's, it, it, it's all ready for you here. The scientist hands a jittering card to Lucifer, who takes it and slides his own delicate hand into his back pocket. When the hand reappears, the card is gone, and it's instead full of what looks like an old-school bottle of laudanum. If John knew his westerns, that's what it was. But Lucifer says, This be careful with. You will see Pluto. Lord, the scientist bows his head and pockets the bottle. Lucifer cups the scientist's face. Did you prepare for yourself as directed? Bunker, everything. I'll have need of you down the line. Lucifer's hand travels down the scientist's cheek to bring the point of future usefulness home. The devil leans forward and kisses the now crying man on the forehead. In your accounts is all the crypto you will ever need, loyal one. Thou art loyal? Yes, the scientist weeps unashamedly before his god. All's ready. It's right where... I know, Lucifer smiles. I already know. Get home and fly. Get settled and make love to your wife. Get ready for a golden future, my friend. The world is about to change. Lucifer winks. My lord! And the scientist runs to his own Toyota, gets in, and speeds off. Astaroth, Lucifer says, one day soon you will know what that feels like. Astaroth smiles. There's little time to enjoy what he's seen. The glass doors open again, and this time they are full of security guards. One is barking at Lucifer, and the other rushes for the Toyota speeding toward the exit. He draws his gun, and Astaroth removes his head for him. The gun clatters to the ground, and the man's hands fly to his spurting neck and clutch for a head that's no longer there. Astaroth kicks him in the back, meaning to send him forward. His strength, new, drives his clawed foot through the man's back, sending vertebrae, organs, and what looks like a half-eaten sandwich flying into the desert. Astaroth gleefully wiggles his talons. A bellowing laugh behind him, baritone. Astaroth grabs the shoulders in front of him and jerks his foot out of the officer's husk. What remains of the poor man plops against the desert sand. Meanwhile, Lucifer casually plucks skin off the officer in his lap. The officer seems to be enjoying it. His eyes loll with the gone junk look. Marble, nothing in the back, glowing ever brighter as Lucifer picks the skin. May we go in? Lucifer asks. Officer? Yes! And he dies. Lucifer dumps his body into the dirt and stands. There is no dust on his suit, as if the being himself is dirt repellent. John, Astaroth, can't call either of themselves men anymore. They enter the building. It looks like a veterinarian's office. Cowering scientists do not speak. Security guards frozen, and Lucifer says, Y'all excused. The frightened scientists head for the exit, chattering, some screaming, panic taking them over. Lucifer snaps his fingers, and the doors lock. He turns and kicks a desk into the throng. The wood splinters twist in the air and hits the floor, becoming a gaggle of chittering wood trolls with a taste for human flesh. Astaroth is impressed. He cannot make out what the trolls are doing. They move like meth hallucinations. But the scientists' flesh and clothes disappear bit by bit, not unlike leaves under caterpillar assault. Blood flows, spurts. Astaroth opens his mouth and gets a wash of human suicide. Not self-slaying, but a mingling of different fluids from different founts. A mixed drink, if you will. Man martini. He laughs and chokes. A bit of blood bubbles down his chest and boils there. Fingers snap and Astaroth turns. The sounds of carnage behind him decrease in volume as if turned down by an invisible hand. What we want is down here, Ash. Lucifer slides the card into an electric lock. Elevator door is open and they step through. Lucifer presses the only button in the elevator, double zero, three times, and the elevator breathes, its doors closing over the screams and chewing sounds. Such an awful dirge they make when they eat, Lucifer says. Dr. Stenthal. That's the scientist I paid to Vamoose. He's the only one allowed down here. I exploited that as I do. I'm a bit of an old hand at exploiting opportunities of all stripes. When Father fucked me on this earth, he gave me one rule I thought to be a joke, Ash, at the time. You can't walk through walls, huh? That's exactly what he said, even with the bloody ha, if you can believe it. And then he was gone. Father is a jocular cunt. At any rate, the inability to walk through walls is a bitch not to have, Ash, and I'll tell you why. You can't just go in places. Have you any idea what an absolute bitch-up it is needing things that are inside places when you can't walk through walls? Places? 
Yes, places, Astaroth, places. Everything I need is in a place of some sort, and all places have walls. Bloody said, damn, it sucks balls. I can kill anyone I want in any way I want. I can make anyone my bitch. I can turn a junkie into a demon if his stars are right as you see, and I can have whatever I want. Drugs, money, women, men, fish, whatever. But I can't walk through fucking walls. Lucifer winks at the ceiling. Clever father, that's all right. You can buy your way into most anywhere. Well, can't you? Churches in which the followers actually believe in my cunting fuckwad of a brother, pussy that he is, and find their ways not to judge others. What bosh? Turn this cheek, you shit. Exemplars, these are men. You'd think of them as wizards. Guard against my infiltrations on occasion. It's doable. Fucking sigil magic. Makes politics a real pain in the balls. That green shit right there, though, Astaroth says. That's going to open new doors for us. He's pointing at what? To a layman. Looks like a giant cylinder of steel sitting atop a thick glass round table. It glows green. Steps lead away from the base of the mechanism. Nuclear shit. That's all Astaroth knew and all he needed to know. That, and that he would pass through the glass on the other side of the thing and join it in junk-sick afterglow. The cold burn where you can't move. The helplessness of a ship sailing somewhere unknown. You are the passenger. Who cares where you wind up because anywhere is better than here. And that's all he knew as he approached the glowing glass, unfurling his wings. That green shit, Ash, is going to bring about my reign. Lucifer types seven six seven six 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 three 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 one 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 into the console. The centrifuge opened, hissing. Astaroth, my old friend, your curse is over. I release you from your bond to me. Don't ever preach for my brother again, and I promise never to turn you into a junkie again. Astaroth stops. Are you angry? Lucifer asks. No. Good. Don't be angry with me. I'm about to hook you the fuck up, as they say. Go give that thing some TLC. Without needing any further instruction from Lucifer, his breath thickened in his abdomen, igniting his flesh. Now glowing white, not red-hot, he stepped into the reactor and hugged it. The laugh. Fireballs erupt across the New Mexico desert. The underground explosion stronger than it ought to have been. The reactor already pushed to limits and choking with overabundant power. Those watching the satellites report later with headlines such as The Earth Vomits Judgment on Mankind. A nuclear explosion whose magnitude stirred up the Earth's core and raises Yellowstone. Astaroth, a flying apocalypse dragon with contempt and magma streaming from his lips. Satan smiles from his throne in Cacitus. The screams of millions choke the creative muck of the unified field. The Earth scorches. God is nowhere to be found.